Hey guys, welcome back to fifth grade reading with Miss Hicks. I hope you've had a productive week with your online classes or doing your packets or maybe just actually enjoying some family time. But this is our last lesson on our Greek and Latin roots. Um, again, our objective is to use combined knowledge of letter and sound, correspondence, syllabication patterns, and morphology to read accurately unfamiliar multisyllabic words in context and out of context. We're going to use both of those today. How can I figure out a new word by breaking it down into parts? Okay, our first one, hydra. Now we've heard it. We've heard it used. Maybe we don't know exactly what its meaning is. It means water, okay? So let's look at our words that I've picked. I have hydrate, I have hydrant, and I have dehydrated. Hopefully you've heard these words. Maybe you know something about them. But let's look at the first one, hydrate. Okay, there's your Greek or Latin root. Let's, use, let's see what it says in the sentence and see if we can come up with a meaning for the word after we've seen it in a sentence and use our context clues. After being in the sun, it's important to hydrate your skin with lotions, gels, or creams. Okay, so what do you think hydrate means? Okay, to put moisture in. All right, well, why, why, why water? Well, when you hydrate yourself, you're taking in water, okay? And with your creams and your moisturizing your skin, you're giving your moisture back to your skin, okay? What about a hydrant? Anybody know about a hydrant? I think most of us know about a hydrant. I think it's a fun thing if they're out there running the water out of the fire hydrant, but let's use it in a, in a sentence. I received a break on my home insurance because of the fire hydrant is in front of my house, okay? So a fire hydrant, what is that? That is the, a pipe or a thing out in front of your head and out on the street, a pipe coming out of the street that has water that the firemen use to put out fires if you have a fire in your house. All right, what about dehydrated? Okay, hmm, there's our word hydrant. Again, what does that mean? Water. So if I dehydrate, okay, D, I'm going to take it out. So I'm going to take the moisture out of something. Let's see it used in a sentence. When my sister had the stomach virus, she became dehydrated. Okay, she lost m much of her body fluids with um, being sick with a stomach bug. And so it does mean to take water out or moisture out. Let's look at our next. Rupt. Hmm. Can I think of anything that uses that and it has that part in a word? I can think of a few. Let's see what it means. It means to burst or to break. Okay. All right. Well, that kind of confirms what I've thought. Let's look at our word choices. We have erupt, interrupt, and corrupt. Okay. So knowing that rupt means to burst or to break, when something erupts, it sends things flying, it bursts out. Here it is used in a sentence. Scientists try to predict when the volcano will erupt again. Think about a volcano eruption. It sends lava and ash up in the air. It's, it's not a gentle little poof, it's an explosion, okay? So what about interrupt? Will any of you ever get in trouble when you interrupt maybe your parents? Or maybe you inter used to interrupt your teacher. Okay, let's see it used in a sentence. It is rude to interrupt other, another person while they are in the middle of a conversation. So again, it means to break or to burst. So, so interrupt, what are you doing? You're breaking into someone's conversation. Okay, corrupt. Hmm, let's use it in a sentence. Some people believe that the violence in video games corrupt children, okay? So corrupt, it means to cause someone or something to break away from their moral thoughts, their moral ethical thoughts, okay? So they think that the video games make children do things that they wouldn't normally do. They break from their normal way of action, okay? So it corrupts them. Next, phone. Hmm. 
it means sound. Okay, well, I think about a lot of words that, you know, think about my phone. When I use my phone, it has the same Greek or Latin root, and I get sound from it. Okay, let's look at some other words. I have homophone, microphone, and phonics. Okay, homophone. Let's look at the sentence and see if we can figure out what homophone is. Sale and sale are homophones. Okay, well, you have sail, S-A-I-L, that's like to sail a boat, sail a ship, and then you have S-A-L-E, is like something that is on sale. So they sound the same if I said it, if I just said, hey, look at that sail. What kind of sail am I talking about? Am I talking about the sail on a ship? Or am I talking about the sail in a store? You would know unless you were with me and knew what I was looking at. So they're pronounced the same, but sometimes they're spelled different or they mean something different, okay? What about microphone, okay? Microphone, let's look at our sentence. The other day during my lesson, the microphone batteries died, okay? Still, microphone, what is it? Micro means small and phone means sound. So is it a small sound? Well, it actually makes a small sound larger, okay? Um, what about phonics? What is phonics? Let's look at the sentence. During early reading instruction, many focus on phonics. Well, we know that phone means sound, and we know that when we first learned how to read, we looked at letters, A, B, C. We looked at the letters, and we learned what the sounds they represent. And we looked at groups of letters and learned what sounds they made. And that's how we learned how to read, so phonics. Very good. Okay, now let's look at Let's think about the words that we've learned, and then I want you to think about groups of words, and let's think about what word doesn't belong, okay? So we're not just learning what a word is, we're learning how to use it, where to use it, and if, we, and if we're using it correctly, okay? So autograph, we learned about an autograph. That was graph meant written, okay? So I have these groups of words. We have write, signature, famous, and message. Well, which one? doesn't belong with this group. Well, graft is right, so right obviously belongs there. An autograph is somebody's signature. Well, what about famous? Generally, autographs are somebody famous, but graft means to write. So what about a message? You write a message, so the one word that doesn't belong, yes, it would be famous. Good job. Look at this next one. Microphone, okay? Deliver, voice, record, and amplify. Hmm. Well, I know it talked about my microphone. It, if I didn't have my microphone, it'd be hard to hear. So that has something to do with my voice. I also know that these lessons are live, but they're also recorded. So my microphone helps it be able to hear what I'm saying on the recording. And it also amplifies my voice. So the one that doesn't belong would be deliver. Because amplify means it makes it bigger. Okay? And, you know, you think about maybe a concert where the singer is singing into the microphone. You couldn't hear it if she didn't have the microphone. The next word, hydrate. We just learned this one also. We have liquid water, lotion, and shake. And we have, remember, that hydra meant water. So I know that water would stay there. I know that water is a liquid, so that one would stay there. And it also, in my sentence, it said something about using lotion to hydrate my skin, so that must stay there. It didn't say anything about shaking anything, so shake would not fit. Good job. Okay, now let's move into our reading. And again, this is our last day of working with analyzing multiple accounts of the same event or topic, noting important similarities and differences in the point of view that they represent. Also, our question that we need to focus on is how does the author's point of view and purpose shape and direct the text? So we're looking at how the author feels about something and how they would write. 
I want you to think for a second. In your classroom, you have classmates who like reading and you have classmates who don't like reading. So if, we were at, if you were asked to write a report about reading, some people would describe it in a wonderful, great way. Other people might describe it as the worst experience of their life, but it's still the same topic, reading. Think back to when we talked about, when I gave the example of the chicken noodle soup, and you had the one person who talked about it being yummy and warm and comforting, and then the other person talked about it being slimy and disgusting. Same soup, just different perspectives, okay? So that's what we have to look at. We have to look at word choices that the author uses. But I want to look first at the Boston Massacre. That's where we're going to look. Now, let's think about the word massacre. Now, this has happened during the American Revolution, which we all studied. We know, do we know what massacre means? It means an indiscriminate and brutal slaughter of large numbers of people. Well, in the Boston Massacre, five people were killed. Is that a massacre or a mishap? Depends on how you view it. Depends on whether you were a British citizen or a colonist. It, that's how you viewed it. I want to look at these pictures. This is a depiction of the Boston Massacre. Now, I want you to look at it closely. It looks like the soldiers are all just standing on one side going against the colonists who were not doing anything. Okay, that's an author's perspective. Now let's look at this other one. Looks like the soldiers are mixed in with the crowd of people and they're not just shooting just for no reason. Okay, two different perspectives of the same event. Okay, word choice and titles. I'm going to read two articles. We have one article called Massacre in Front of the British Tax Building. We have another one, Riot in Boston with Unfortunate End. They're both describing what went on during the Boston Massacre, but one of them calls it a massacre, which you, it, you think of lots of people dying, a horrible thing. The other one, it's a riot, and it had an unfortunate ending. So one's a little more sympathetic to maybe the British than the other one, okay? Riot in Boston with an unfortunate end. Since the British troops arrived in 1768, the life of soldiers in Boston was not much better than those of the citizens who were sent to keep under control. It's not only the hatred by the locals that made it so difficult, the Redcoats were also severely mistreated by their own commanders, including severe physical punishment for every minor violation. The soldiers' pay was miserable, and they weren't even allowed to keep all of it. Could you imagine getting a paycheck and not being able to keep it? Hmm. It is well known that the organizers of street mobs, Samuel Adams and William Mullinex, were trying the best to stir up anti-British feelings. Now remember, we studied anti, it means against, so against the British, they wanted to stir it up. As the events in front of the Customs House unfolded, it's plain to see that a, peace po pro a peaceful protest was the last thing on the minds of protesters. On March 5th, 1770, at approximately 9 p.m., an angry crowd approached Sentry Hugh White standing on guard outside of the Customs House. By this time, the agitators have already been in another street brawl where were ready for action. Captain Preston was worried the large, angry mob would attack and maybe even steal the collected British tax money. One of the American leaders, Edward Garrick, started insulting Private White. From there, the situation quickly escalated. Despite British Captain Preston trying to control the crowd by yelling peaceful orders, the angry mob was getting out of control. There were almost a hundred angry, screaming Americans and only seven soldiers. Numbers don't quite seem right, do they? The seven British soldiers tried to take White to, to safety but could not reach him and were forced to defend themselves. Some of the attack 
attackers were waving clubs, throwing stones, and ice-filled snowballs. Americans screamed horrible threats and taunts and taunted them. You should fire. You can't kill us all. Fire. Why don't you fire? You dare not fire. In the next few minutes, the violence reached its peak. One of the attackers threw a club at Private Hugh Montgomery, knocking him off his feet. Rising, Montgomery fired a shot into the air. He was stricken again with a club, and Montgomery had no choice but to point his gun at the attacker, Richard Palms, who quickly fled. At the same time, another soldier, Private Matthew Kilroy, pointed his musket at the other two attackers, Edward Langford and Samuel Gray. There was a misunderstanding in all the chaos, and the soldiers may have heard, don't fire as fire, and he fired into the crowd, probably confused due to the anger and the fear of being beaten by a club. Private Kilroy pulled the trigger, mortally wounded Gray. More shots were fired and more people fell to the ground, wounded or dead, leaving the aftermath of five civilian deaths. It was unfortunate that the innocent people were killed, but those who were shot in Boston Massacre were as much of victims of the angry crowd as they were of the accidental shooting by the soldiers. Quickly, the innocent was blown out of proportion and used for propaganda. Even though tragic, the death of the colonists actually helped to improve relations between the king and the colony. Just a month after the incident, in April 1770, the unpopular Townshend Act was lifted and everyone in Boston started breathing better. Okay, so they're kind of on the edge, on the thoughts of the British soldiers maybe. Okay, let's look at our next article. Same event, different perspective. This is the one massacre in front of the British tax building. Since the British troops were forced upon average American citizens, the life of the Americans have been horrible. Hardworking Americans have been forced to care for, feed, and house rowdy British soldiers. In addition to the Quartering Act, Americans were also forced to pay incredibly high taxes on average things like paper. In Boston, the constant mistreatment of, has people like Samuel Adams and William Mullinox boiling over, the, their, with, boiling over with frustration. They began to organize peaceful protests to give citizens a voice. On March 5, 1770, around 9 p.m., frustrated citizens approached British sentry Hugh White on guard in front of the Customs House. This was the location where the British handled all the high taxes on the citizens. Edward Garrick, a concerned citizen, started welling his frustrations on the British guard, Private White. From there, the situation quickly escalated. The argument became a rough back and forth, more, a rough back and forth, more people joining in, and seven soldiers came out to face the people of the town with their muskets. A British captain, Preston, was yelling orders at his soldiers, making more Americans scared. Americans were angrily waving clubs and throwing snowballs at the soldiers. They were yelling, you shouldn't fire at the British. In the next few minutes, the violence reached its peak when an angry American citizen, Richard Palms, threw a club and hit Private Montgomery. It knocked him over. He was stricken again with a club, and Montgomery had no choice but to point his gun at the attacker, Richard Palms, who quickly fled. Rising, Montgomery fired a shot into the air. At the same time, another soldier, Private Matthew Kilroy, pointed his musket at another two attackers, Edward Langford and Samuel Gray. Out of nowhere, the British soldiers opened fire on a crowd of innocent American citizens. In the confusion and chaos, five Americans died for simply voicing their frustrations. The strong soldiers opened fire on a crowd of innocent average people. The tragic deaths of these five Americans showed the rest of the country just how horrible the British were capable of being. This forced the rest of, Amer of America to learn a lesson about the way British people and soldiers treated them. The peaceful crowd should have been allowed to express their thoughts without being slaughtered by the British soldiers. Okay? So let's look at it paragraph by paragraph. In the first two paragraphs, okay, if we look at the word choices, we have that the British troops arrived. 
But in the second paragraph, it says the British troops were forced. So arriving just sounds like, oh, well, they came. But in the second one, they're forced upon the American people. It also said that it's not only the hatred of the locals that made it difficult. And here it says that the Americans were forced to care for them. So they use different words to describe the same event. What about the next two paragraphs? Okay, it starts off, same thing, that it happened at approximately 9 p.m. But it talks about an angry crowd. And then it talks about mm, just frustrated citizens. Okay, and how they, how they worked. The next ones, okay, it's talking about the violence came to a peak. It says that in both of them. But here it says the attackers threw a club. And here it says that an angry American citizen. Do you see the difference in the word choices that they use? And finally, the last two paragraphs, it talks about that it was unfortunate that the innocent people were killed. But in this last one, it says that the tragic deaths of these five Americans, unfortunate and tragic, okay? So, how did the author in the first article feel about the British soldiers and the colonists? The author in the first article thought that the British soldiers were mistreated and misjudged and the incident was not, so, not really their fault. The author states at the end, that the deaths were unfortunate and that they were the victims of the crowd as much as of the soldiers. So the crowd was just as much to blame as what the first one felt like. The second article. The author of the second article thought that the British soldiers were forced on the poor American colonists and that the violence happened just showed everybody how awful the British troops treated the colonists. And he even described the crowd as being peaceful, and they should have been allowed to express their opinions. Same event, two totally different things. Word choice is very important when you're ready to figure out how an author feels. Okay? Let's look at this article about spiders. Lots of people are afraid of spiders, but I think that spiders are awesome animals. There are 45,000 different types of spiders crawling on Earth. Spiders love to eat insects. They eat about 2,000 different insects every single year. That means that spiders keep other bugs out of my house. Spiders love to eat mosquitoes. Hmm. Mosquitoes cause itchy red bites and can spread diseases. Luckily, the spiders help to keep the mosquito population in check. Spiders help to keep my garden growing. Bugs will sneak into my garden and eat my vegetable plants. Bugs like to turn my beautiful flowers into an afternoon snacks. Spiders help to keep to eat these bugs. In fact, many organic farmers rely on spider, spiders to eat their bugs. There are only two types of spiders in the United States that are dangerous to humans. The black widow spider and the brown recluse spider are both poisonous. Luckily, these spiders only bite when they feel threatened. In some cultures, spiders are worshipped. The Hopi tribe believed that the spider was the goddess of earth. In ancient Greece, a spider woman named Archaea was the best weaver in the whole country. Many African cultures tell stories about a spider named Anasi. The spider helps to teach other animals important lessons. In Japan, it is considered bad luck to kill a spider. Humans should not be afraid of spiders. We should thank them and begin... and, and we should thank them for being great friends. Okay? So how does this author feel about spiders? I think she liked them. I think she thought that they were beneficial. Bene being good. Okay? And how did we know? Well, she talked about that they eat insects. They kept her garden growing. There are only two kinds that are dangerous in the United States. Everywhere, she continuously talked about the good things they did. And even when she was describing mosquitoes, that they ate mosquitoes and how bad mosquitoes were. So I hope you've enjoyed our lessons on perspective. And I hope you come back next week. We're going to talk about writing answers, um, how to analyze details and text evidence. And we're going to talk about some homophones. So I hope you have a great weekend. I'll tell your moms, happy Mother's Day, and we'll see you Monday.